the unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand million kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha. Excuse me. Homage to the Dharma. Homage to the Sangha. Thank you. The topic of my talk this morning is going to be thirsting for something else. And my way, lately anyway, is to use stories to illustrate what I would like to share with you. So I'm going to start off with a story about, it's an actual experiment that happened a long time ago because it makes a very good point, and then I'll carry on with um, some other stuff. And this is a documented story, and it's actually, let's see what's the end of it, is... um, it's an experiment that was done in 1954, like right after World War II, and is now regarded as a classic of social psychology. And it's uh, not Buddhist per se, but there's some really good um, illustrations here of what our minds get up to in a way that isn't uh, something reliable. You know, so here we go. not from lack of trying or believing. On June 19, 1954, 11 boys from Oklahoma City boarded a bus bus bound for a summer camp. The boys had never met before, but all had just completed fifth grade and came from middle-income families. All were white and Protestant. When they reached the summer camp, there was no other campers there. And they, these, this group of boys dubbed themselves the Rattlers. The following day, a second group of boys, also white, Protestant, and middle class, arrived at the camp. They were assigned to a cabin that could not be seen from the first group. They decided to call themselves the Eagles. For a week, the two groups went about their activities, swimming, tossing, uh, baseball, etc., unaware of the other at all at all during the the day or night. As they ate, played, and tussled, each band developed its own hierarchy and hence its own mores. The rattlers, for instance, took took to cursing. The eagles frowned upon profanity. Okay, this is all independent. They knew nothing about each other. Toward the end of the week, the two groups learned about each other. The reaction was swift. Each group wanted to challenge the other to a contest, and the, their counselors scheduled a tournament. On the first day, the Rattlers won at both baseball and tug-of-war. The Eagles were livid. One of them declared that the Rattlers were too big, they couldn't be fifth, fifth graders, that they had to be much older. The Eagles, on their way back to their cabin that evening, Notice that their rivals had attached a team flag to the backstop of the baseball field where the rattles, Rattlers had won the baseball game. They tore it down and set it on fire. Okay? The next morning, the two groups got into a fist fight, which had to be broken up by the counselors. That day, the group's position reversed. The Eagles won the baseball game, a development that they attributed to their prayers for victory Enter the rival's foul mouth. Okay, their profanity. This goes on. Then they won the tug of war. The rattlers responded to these setbacks by raiding the eagles' cabins after the eagles had gone to sleep. The eagles staged a counterattack while their adversaries were at breakfast. The rattlers accused the eagles of being communists. So you see how this thing is starting to... um, turn into something um, way beyond what was going on in this situation. And it goes on. As tensions mounted, both groups became increasingly aggressive and self-justifying. Then members of each group announced that they wanted nothing to do with the other. 
This all kinds of sounds familiar, doesn't it, to uh, some of the opinions, strong ideas that are going around today. The counselors, who were really grad students, were just getting going. They brought the bands together for another contest. Hundreds of beans were strewn in the dirt, and each boy was given a minute to collect as many as he could in a paper bag. Then, one by one, the boys were called up, and the contents of their bags ostensibly projected onto a screen for everyone to count. In fact, the bags had never been opened. The same beans were projected onto the screen over and over in different arrangements. Okay. The rattlers saw what they wanted to, and so did the eagles. By the former reckoning, each rattler had gathered, on an average, 10 more beans than, the, than their rivals. But the latters, the eagles, were the better bean picker uppers by a margin of 20%. Okay? The whole elaborate experiment is now regarded, like I said, as a classic of social psychology. The participants have been chosen because they were so much alike. All it took for them to loathe one another was a different uh, animal totem, the rattlers or the eagles, and a reward for a penknife, which was given as, one, as a prize in one of the contests. Okay, but the story doesn't end there. After, nud after having nudged the eagles rather than the, the rattlers towards conflict, this is the counselors, the researchers wanted to see if they could nudge them back together. They brought the boys together for a variety of peaceable activities. Um, one day, for example, they arranged, arranged for the two groups to meet up in the mess hall for lunch. The result was a food fight. <laughs> Since uh, contact situations weren't working, the researchers moved to on to uh, what they would call contrived cr crises. They staged a series of crises. One was they staged a water shortage, and the second one was a sec uh, supply truck had broken down. The, and these crises could only be resolved if the boys cooperated. Dealing with these manufactured emergencies made the groups a lot more friendlier towards one another, to the point where on the trip back to Oklahoma City, the rattlers used five dollars they had won from the bean collecting contest to treat the eagles to candy. So, it, you know, this is, that's where the, the experiment ends, but it makes a really good point that it's so easy to think that, that you or we know what is happening and to act on that in a way that can be harmful, okay? Or not, but it just gives me uh, not a lot of confidence in my own ability to make decisions on what I observe. But to do something else, and that's where the Buddhist practice can come into uh, play here. It just seems from this story that it just so is it's so easy to react and, 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 and move and slide right into us versus them. It just seems to be maybe a, a survival or a protection thing that we fall into so easily, and it just doesn't always have good results. Now, I was thinking about another story, which I like. Because the, the story with the, the young boys was more um, to help us. That reading the story helps us to look at our own ideas as well as others and really wonder what is true and what is deluded within ourselves when we are in a situation. And not to act so, um, what do you call it, uh, knowingly that we know what's going on. Okay, So I'll leave that there. And now I have another story that I like, and I probably I read it to somebody as a group, but I don't know who it was, but it's a, it makes a really good um, point, another one, another kind of point. Because this situation is more um, with trying, not trying, but changing one's view based on being threatened, um, seriously threatened. Okay, and this comes from one of my f nice little books I like to read, Not Always So, by uh, Shunru Suzuki. 
And it's about, this story is one that he found had turned his life around, okay? And so I'm going to read the whole thing to you because it, it, it's, uh, it's well done. My practice of meditation changed about two years ago, almost a- after I almost drowned. I wandered across the, the creek at Tassajara, that's where the monastery was. But he says, I cannot swim, but the students were enjoying the water so much I thought I would join them. They were, there were many beautiful girls over there, so I tried to go over there, forgetting that I couldn't swim, and I almost drowned. But I knew I would not die. I knew I would not drown because there were many students and someone would surely come to help me. So I was not so serious. But the feeling was pretty bad. I was swallowing water, so I stretched out my arms hoping that someone would catch me, but no one did. I decided to go to the bottom to walk, but that was not possible either. I could not reach the bottom and I could not get above the surface. What I saw was the legs of these beautiful girls, but I could not take hold of their legs, and I was rather scared. After that time, I realized that we never have good practice until we become quite serious. Because I knew that I was was not dying, I was not so serious, and I became, and because I was not so serious, I had a very difficult time. If I knew I was dying, I would have struggled, I would not have struggled anymore. I would have stayed still. Because I thought I had another moment, I had, did not become serious. Since then, my practice has improved. So it was something that he really needed to um, not just go through the situation, but to recognize that he was actually threatened in a way that, that he was swallowing water and nobody was coming to help him. And that somehow gave him a chance to wake up and not to take things... Um, for granted, and it turned his life around where he just said, I need to take what's going on in my life seriously. I need to take my practice seriously. And also with this story that I read first, I didn't finish the, where is it? Where it go? Um, that story could also, can help us to change our our. our um, ideas about what things are for sure. And same with uh, Shunru Suzuki. He, he thought these, these uh, people across the stream, if you've ever been to Tassahar, it's not a very big stream, but it was d- deep enough that he couldn't swim across. And he didn't know how. But it changed his mind because what he thought was going to be a lifesaver, what he was used to grabbing after, was not there. It just simply wasn't there, and he was swallowing water. And then with the boy's situation... Um, in order to, the, the, some way that, that two people could come together would be in a crisis. And I think we, would, we can kind of make sense because you have a common ground there. But the, the story, the very ending sense, sentence is, the hitch, of course, is that they, the boys first needed to agree on what the crises were. You know what, you know what I'm saying? And that's, for in our day and age, there's so much that you can't really rely on in terms of, is this true? Is this really going on? It's very confusing. And I'm not pretending it's not. So, um, I think what I'd like to talk about next is um, how we perceive things. Do we have... And we live. We happen to live in a world where there's a lot of information. Like so much information, it's very hard to take it all in. You know, we have to learn to filter it out, or to prioritize, or to to do something with it because it just keeps coming our way. And it's not a. It's not that our brain. Our brains are very good at taking things in. You know, just information just comes in through our senses, and then the brain kicks in and, and, and works with it to make some kind of sense out of it. And this, the sense that it makes out of isn't always accurate. It does come in, and it's what we've got, but what comes in with our brains working the way they do, it isn't always 
you, you know, I don't know who could say it really and truly is the truth in a very comprehensive, universal way. What our brains are saying, you know, this is different kind of a knowing. Um, and so we need help, or I need help. You know, we all need help, actually. Um, oh, wait, I've got to go over here. So you have information coming in, and then what do you try to do with it? You try to understand it. And one of the ways that one of the books I'm reading says to do that is to simply, this is Buddhist, have an attitude of awareness as a basis of your understanding or our understanding. Because that information, of, that, information that awareness can help us is that the awareness itself, can, we can observe what our brains are doing. You know, we can actually observe. You know, I think if we have, all of us have moments where we think, oh, I wish I hadn't done such and such. And there, while you're going through that process, you think there's something in you that, that recognizes that, that maybe I shouldn't be doing a certain thing, but it, 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 it's that awareness that can actually help our brains to, um, to turn around so that we're not so controlled, so we don't have this reactive thing like these boys did so much, but that we can actually reflect on uh, what we're doing just a little bit. It's not to get weird about it, so that every time somebody says, how are you today, you say, wait a minute, I've got to get aware of <laughs> my feelings about all of this. Hang on, just I need time out, time out, you know, that kind of thing. It's more like you just have it built in, because the awareness is always there. And it's just like you can recognize, you can almost feel the patterns kind of going down a road that perhaps you kind of start to feel uncomfortable with. You know, it's kind of like, eh, I don't know about this. But it doesn't quite get into that awareness thing. But if we can be more, become just a little bit more aware of what our brains are observing, then maybe we can take a pause moment that is just brief and uh, not noticeable by other people. And we can learn to respond in a way rather than to react. But we still need help. I mean, that's, that's a tall order for all of us, I think, is to, to change in that way. But we still need help. And one thing that I found, I'm always looking for bridges between, um, you know, our minds as they, they just kind of churn and churn and churn. And what can really help us to turn towards the, our Buddhist practice? So this one writer says, what can help us is, uh, is to um, the Four Noble Truths. And I like, uh, and the Four Noble Truths, in case people don't know what, that, what they are, is the first one is suffering exists. And the second one, I really like this one. This is from Sowaki Koto. This, it, of course, we would say it's attachment, but he calls that frustrated desire. And I think that's spot on as far as I'm concerned. We're always trying to desire things, and then they do get frustrated, and we are in that attachment mode in that very moment, if you see what I'm saying. So, of course, the uh, cessation of suffering is to relieve that frustrated desire or the attachment and then to, to follow through with the Eightfold Path. That's what the Four Noble Truths are, but the thing I wanted to address here is um, a way of bridging things. So, um, The Four Noble Truths, what they can do is they can help us to, to give us a perspective. If we can remember the Four Noble Truths and say that, I don't really like to suffer, and I know it exists. I know that I suffer. That's an honest uh, assessment. And it's, it is due to a frustrated desire of some sorts. And I think you can look, all of us can look at that on a very mundane level where we can see that, you know, I was grabbing for something, else that wasn't here in the moment and it got frustrated and so what we build on that is this uh, this reaction this kind of uh, speedy reaction but what the the four noble truths they are called truths is that they can give us a perspective in which to see and contain other information in which to have the wisdom to be able to see what is worth studying what is worth retraining retaining and what is worthless 
So in other words, we have a soundboard by, by using the, the Four Noble Truths as a filter to help us guide our ways because we don't know what we're doing a lot of the time and we're deluded. Okay, that's kind of a grand statement, but I think if we honestly look at ourselves, or that's true for myself. And I found with the, uh, the story with uh, Suzuki Roshi that he, the point that he was at, he was drowning, he was swallowing water, but there was something in him that he was actually open and receptive to something else, a better way. Like, I'm not taking my life seriously, right in the midst of swallowing water and, you know, can't swim, drown, and all this sort of stuff. But there was something that just opened up in him. And so I wanted to talk about what to trust. I think that's a real juicy topic for this day and age. And what I have found through thinking about this and reading a little bit about it is that Trust isn't, isn't often an instant kind of thing. You, do, you can say, well, I trust such and such, but then that moment's gone, and you've got the next moment. And I find that trust just takes time. It's a development. So you say, how do you trust um, a person? Or how do I trust the Four Noble Truths? Or um, how do I trust, I don't know, there's just a lot of things. What do I trust that's something that's good to do? And what trust asks of us in a certain kind of way is that we find something that we are interested in trying, a piece of information, an idea, and then understand it, and then see if we have um, any interest at all or we would like to try it out, see if it works. And it takes a lot of time to say, you know, this works, but it needs a refinement. And this is kind of normal. And this, this works this way, but this needs a refinement. And over time, you build a trust. And what can that trust be? For us, as Buddhists, it can be our meditation practice. It can be the precepts. It can be the Four Noble Truths. A lot of things that we can take on board and see, is there a trust in there? Do I trust this or not? And why not? Or do I want to? Or do I care? And so you can just pick it up or not. I was thinking too about the retreat that um, you all had the continuing practice retreat this weekend and social harmony. And let me find, oh, social harmony, where'd I go? One thing I find true, or true enough for myself, is that if you're online and all the time, you can, believe it or not, lose your skill for socializing with other people. You just, and I base this on when I'm out at the Hermitage for a month, after four weeks, and I don't talk to a single person. I, somebody calls me on the phone, one of the monks, and it's like I have to kind of cough up, like, oh, yeah, i got to kind of put work, you know, say something, you know, be convivial or nice or something. It, you know, it's a kind of a skill that within a month it starts to waver a bit, and I lose that skill. And I feel that when you connect on the Internet and stay connected too much that you get lopsided and you just lose the skill to talk to somebody. And that's kind of fair enough. Um, you know, it's not a, a fault-finding thing. But what um, I found, how do you overcome something like that? And what came to my mind is you take a situation like uh, we can say, this last, what, I don't know, 10 days has been excessively hot. You know, I think we're breaking records and all that kind of stuff. Every day has approached 100 or has been over 100 degrees. And that's um, enough to get all of our attention and to cope with things in a different way. And what we can do in these kinds of situations is if you feel awkward socially, there, you can actually uh, give. You can reach out to people in a way that is really non-threatening socially. So what I'm saying is if it's an excessive heat situation, 
you can make sure your neighbor's doing all right. You know he's he's an older person, or you can uh, talk to your, you know, meet a friend and say, how are you doing? In other words, you, you go beyond your own uh, concerns and um, worries and problems. Or you can say, um, you know, see if there's lots of places where people need help in these kinds of situations. To find this kind of thing so that it would give you a, and what do you call it, non-threatening ground, ground. You know, get a dog and take it for a walk or take somebody's dog for a walk and that's a really great social breaker. And that helps you to kind of be at ease and once again learn how to, to interact with people. And it's not a bad thing to, um, to do that, to help people out. And what happens with helping others out is lo and behold, you find that it actually is a benefit to yourself and others. So it's not completely altruistic it's something that you can actually do to help your own self out in your social skills and who knows what else goes beyond that. But there's a definite pathway for us there. So it's, it's, and I find when things get really tough, like the success of heat is a serious thing that we um, just naturally find out, how are you doing? Are you drinking lots of water, you know? around here and just, uh, or you've had COVID, or how are you recovering? You know, just the things that we can re really relate to, we can just, int um, what do you call it, engage people in that way and can help us to learn to have our social skills so they don't get so um, dusty, you know, kind of old and worn out. Now, let's see here. Um, now, I do want to talk about feelings a little bit in terms of stuff coming in with our brains. Because, what, and what I want to talk about specifically is uh, grief. Um, because it's, it's a feeling that is very um, strong when you have lost someone near to you. And it, it just leaves you kind of like a bare, empty space. And the, the question arises, do I just bear it? And ha just hope it will pass, and just kind of make uh, make it like I can handle this, and I don't need any help. And thank you very much. But what I find here is that Buddhism doesn't turn away from grief or anything else. It's inclusive all of all things. And through our meditation practice, what we can do is sit and allow the grief to be there, and the stillness too. So one's not excluding, the, one's, it's not an exclu, uh, ex excluding kind of situation. You know, you're not excluding the grief and you're not excluding, excluding your, your ability to sit still in a situation. And some people could say, well, isn't, you know, if you're sitting still in a situation, you're not exactly um, grieving, you're not kind of connected to it in that moment. It's, and it's callous. You're not. You're being too, too um, kind of hard, hard-hearted. You're just ignoring this. That is not what our meditation practice offers us. It offers us a, um, a knowing, uh, not a knowing so much as just an inclusiveness, and it does not push away things that need to be, that are part of our lives. And what I have found from this, I talked to a monk about this just a, a while ago, and I said, well, what's your response to these kinds of situations? And he said, well, first thing I come up with is, I don't know. And then he says, and then he says, I don't know, you know, to the, to the bigger picture, the Buddhas and the answers. I don't know what to do here. So he's more open. It's not just a what do you call it, a, a dark, I don't know, you know, I don't know and things are awful. It's not that kind of thing. It's an I don't know, period. So he opens up and he's more receptive. And knowing the falsity of going to any thoughts of knowing or judgment about a situation, he just simply stays in that place of I don't know. I thought that was really good advice. I find because what happens in these kinds of situations where, say, grief, and we can grieve for the planet, there's just plenty of things to grieve for um, today. But 
what happens with people is when you come upon something that is so big like grief or you're with somebody that's dying or there's a fire, fire, a fire right close to you and you feel threatened and you want to help, we feel helpless. And part of it is we just can't understand situations sometimes when they arise. It's like they are a mystery to the human brain. We just don't know. We simply do not know. In that position of I only don't know is something that can be open to, well, what can I do in this situation? How can I help? Can I change? You know, what is it I can do to benefit myself and others? I, you know, you can say, I don't know. And to be still within that is where um, something just may come through and help you out. Okay, well I'm going to end with a story. This is a story, my own story. Uh, and then it goes into um, Sowaki Koto's quote. So a few weeks ago we were out on an outing and we got to go swimming in a lake, one of the high mountain lakes. And I was surprised the water, there was still water in it, you know, <laughs> with the drought we had last summer. So I was swimming away and I have tried to, to learn how to swim again because I, I, you know, I'm not a kind of, I haven't done it for so long. But I was thinking, okay, you got to learn how to do this and you got to do that. Oh, that wasn't a very good one. You got to put your leg, you know, all this stuff. I was going, oh my God, this is, it was like I was trying to find the perfect stroke. And I knew it, you know. <laughs> there was this awareness there and I thought, ah, this is really tiring. I said, here I am in this beautiful place and I can't, uh, I can't relax. And so I just let that go. I said, I am tired of trying to be perfect <laughs> and find the perfect stroke. And so I just said, blah, relax. And I did. And what happened is that instead of getting all hung up in perfect stroke, I just swam. And it wasn't a big deal, but it was like that perfectness, ideas of it dropped away. And it was like there was an expansiveness that was kind of just there. And I, it, wasn't a, it wasn't anything special. It just kind of what was. I didn't make anything out of it. And I simply just kept swimming for a little bit. But the, the lake, it was a shallow lake. And I opened my eyes and I saw this great big dark log that was on the bottom of the, the, the lake. And I went, oh my God, I wonder what's living underneath there. So right away, my brain kicked in with, ah, I got to swim faster over this log so that the whatever's down there won't get me. And so I lost that, you know, that sense of relaxation. But th th there, there was a point there where I actually could um, open up to not having the perfect stroke. And then comes Sowaki Koto's um, quote. It's about swimming again. So he, he would often say, living is the whole universe. Okay, this is his uh, way of ex um, expressing that. It is impossible for a fish to say, I have swum the whole water. It is impossible for a bird to say, I have flown the whole sky. But f fish have swum the whole water, he says, and birds have flown the whole sky. It is not a matter of quantity, but of quality. We work with our hands and feet within a radius of only three fit, feet in the whole of heaven and earth. He just has a way of kind of going, you know, like that. So you're thinking, I'm you know, swimming away. And for me, what that brought me back to is I only don't know as a way just to say, and I'm okay with that. I only don't know from this story. And what inspires me is not to limit my knowledge of a situation because I think I know what is going on because I only really don't know. And that's 